Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson and Excel International Level, Chemistry Unit 5 for June 2020. This is the part 3 video. I'll put the link to the part 1 and part 2 videos below in the description box. Let us begin. Question 24 says, this question is about transition metals and their compounds. Three reactions were carried out on a solution containing hexa aqua ions 3 plus ions. This is the complex we have here. There is reaction one where there is ammonia and a red brown precipitate forms. There is another reaction where we form that and another reaction where we form that. So the first question says, complete the equation for reaction one. State symbols are not required. So here, if a red brown precipitate was formed, this is going to be a deprotonation reaction. Three ammonias must have been used because this is three plus to produce this compound here, which is going to be the red brown precipitate, it's a solid. Here they say, state the type of reaction occurring in reaction two. Reaction two, we can see there were six water ligands, but now we just have five water ligands and the sixth ligand that has been introduced. So that must be a ligand substitution reaction, or some people call it ligand exchange. Part three says, complete the diagram to show the structures of the complex ion formed in reaction three, showing all the atoms. In reaction three, we are using ethylene diamine as the ligand. That is a bidentate ligand. Since iron has coordination number six, it means we are going to use three ligands, and therefore the structure should appear like this. We have three ligands, one, the second one, and the third one. And here we had to put square brackets in order to put the three plus charge outside. Remember, ethylene diamine is not charged, it's neutral. So if iron has three plus charge, when the ligands attached to it are all neutral, it means the whole complex is going to have a charge of three plus. Moving on, part B says, vanadium can exist in the oxidation state, plus two, plus three, plus four, and plus five. They say complete the table to show the colors of the ions that each of these oxidation states has in aqueous solution. Vanadium three is going to be green, vanadium four is blue, and vanadium five is yellow. Moving down here, here they say, two vanadium species exist in equilibrium in an aqueous solution. This is plus 5 oxidation state, and that is plus 5. They said deduce whether or not this is a redox reaction, and just fire your answer in terms of oxidation numbers. Because this is plus 5, and that is plus 5, and in all this, oxygen is minus 2, while hydrogen is plus 1, we can say it is not a redox reaction, because the oxidation number of vanadium in both species is plus 5. Moving on. Here they say, predict the oxidizing agent that could convert vanadium-2 ions to vanadium-3 ions and then vanadium-4 ions, but not vanadium-5 ions under standard conditions. They say only use the data from the table shown, include equations and ether cell values for the two reactions that occur. So based on this information, we have to convert vanadium-2 to vanadium-3, and we have to convert vanadium-3 to vanadium-4. However, this reaction should not occur. So this should occur, that should occur, but this should not occur. We will look at the electrode potentials here and the electrode potentials here. Anything that is going to convert vanadium-2 to vanadium-3 should have a higher electrode potential, meaning that thing should be going this way as vanadium-2 goes the other side. So we'll look for anything that has electrode potential greater than negative 0 0.26. All these can convert vanadium-2 to vanadium-3. When we go to conversion of vanadium-3 to vanadium-4, we can see the electrode potential is that. However, this is not higher, so that cannot convert. But this and that are higher than plus 0 0.34, so we can use them. Because we do not want this reaction to occur in the opposite direction, we need to choose something whose electrode potential is lower than this one. So when we see among the ones we have ticked, it's only this one that qualifies because that is higher. So this is going to be the possible oxidizing agent that can be used to convert vanadium-2 to vanadium-3 and vanadium-3 to vanadium-4 but not vanadium-4 to vanadium-5. So my answer is 8. Based on the redox potentials, NO3 is a suitable oxidizing agent because it gives positive e theta values to oxidize vanadium-2 to vanadium-3, vanadium-3 to 4, but it gives a negative e theta cell value for vanadium-4 to vanadium-5. To convert vanadium-2 to vanadium-3, this should be the overall equation for that reaction, and the e theta cell value should be that, and therefore this reaction should be feasible. To convert vanadium-3 to vanadium-4, this is going to be the equation for that reaction, and the e theta value calculated is going to be 
positive 0.46 volts. And so because this is positive, we can say that this reaction is also feasible. Now, NO3 minus cannot oxidize because when you calculate the E theta value, it comes out as negative 0.2 volts. So this should not be feasible. Therefore, NO3 should be a suitable reagent for the oxidation of vanadium 2 to 3, vanadium 3 to 4, but not vanadium 4 to 5. Moving on. Here they say, transition metals, their compounds and their ions can act as heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysts. Compare and contrast these two types of catalytic behavior. They wanted to include specific examples from transition metal chemistry of each of these type of catalysts and the reaction in which it is used. Every time they give you a question about compare and contrast, you have to write the similarities as well as the differences. So I began with the similarities. Both act as catalysts by providing an alternative pathway with lower activation energy, and therefore they speed up the rate of a reaction since a greater fraction of molecules will have energy equal to or greater than the activation energy for successful collisions to occur. For the differences, heterogeneous catalysts are in different phase than the reactants, while homogeneous catalysts are in the same phase as the reactants are. This point earns you your second mark. Now, I went on to talk about the examples. Examples of heterogeneous catalysts include iron in the harbor process, nickel in the hydrogenation of alkenes, platinum in catalytic converters, and so on. Here, you could have undermarked if you had just written one example. Examples of homogeneous catalysts include the iron 2 iron 3 in the reaction between iodide ions and peroxidisulfate ions. This is the reaction I'm talking about, and in this reaction, either iron 2 or iron 3 can be used as catalysts. Moving on. Lastly, I talked about the mechanisms of this reaction, so I said, during mechanisms involving heterogeneous catalysts, reactant molecules are adsorbed onto the surface of the catalyst, the bonds between the reactant molecules are weakened, and the reaction takes place on the surface of the catalyst, leading to formation of the products. The formed products dissolve from the surface of the catalyst. During mechanisms involving homogeneous reactions or homogeneous catalysts, a transition metal ion, this is a catalyst, is oxidized or reduced to a different oxidation state in one step of the reaction, and then the oxidized or reduced version is then changed back into the original state in another step in order to regenerate the catalyst. The example is this reaction here. And again, you didn't have to write this as well. So peroxidized sulfate reacts with iodide to form sulfate as well as iodine. This is the reaction. However, in here we use a homogeneous catalyst because it's also in aqueous phase as the reactants are. This reaction goes on in a two-step mechanism. In the first one, peroxidized sulfate reacts with iron 2 plus. This is the catalyst. The catalyst is going to be oxidized to iron 3 as this is converted to that. And then the produced iron 3 is going to react with the other reactant, which is iodide, in order to regenerate the catalyst as well as form the other product. So this is one example of how some of these homogeneous catalysts work. Moving on. Question 25. The lanthanides form a series in the periodic table comprising of elements from lanthanum. This is from 57 to 71. They have important uses as elements and compounds, for example, in screens, circuits and speakers of smartphones. These elements have some similar properties to the block elements. Many of the lanthanide elements are obtained by heating their trichloride or trifluoride with calcium at a thousand degrees. These elements form part of the F block of the periodic table as the last electron added enters the F abiters. The electronic configurations of the atoms consist of the electronic configuration of xenon followed by electrons in the 4f and 6s orbital, and sometimes 5d orbitals, for example, the ones you can see here, these ones here. Down here they say, all of the lanthanides form ions with a charge of 3+, plus, and the ionic radii of these ions decrease as the atomic number of the elements increases. The lanthanides form complex ions, for example, this one here and that. You guys can see here we have more ligands than normal. These are more than 6 ligands, and that means the size is really big to accommodate more ligands than six. Many of the complex ions formed from the elements in the lanthanide series are colored, and this color is caused by F to F transitions. Cerium for ammonium nitrate is yellow in aqueous solution and gives a red color with all alcohols. 
Cerium 4 ammonium sulfate is used in redox titrations with ferrine as an indicator, and the color change is red to yellow. Use your knowledge of the black elements to help you answer the questions below. The first question says write the equation for the reduction of holmium 3 fluoride, HOF3, by calcium. State symbols are not required. Because we know this is written like that, it means this is 3 plus, and therefore calcium is going to displace to form calcium fluoride and we are going to form HO. I had to balance the equation by multiplying by 2 here, a 3 here, a 2 here, and a 3 here. The reason for multiplying by a 3 here because F2 was a 2 here, so we have to make them 6 because this was a 3 as well. The electronic configuration of xenon is that. Suggest the reason why gadolinium has the electronic configuration of that rather than that. This is due to stability like what we see in chromium. So I say there is extra stability associated with a half-filled F subshell. Do not say orbital here. Complete the electronic configuration of SM3+. I'm going to take you back so that we can see the configuration of SM. SM is like that. And if SM3+, it needs to lose two electrons here in the S and then one electron here. So we're going to have xenon and for F5. And therefore, this was the answer for that. Part C says explain why the ionic radii of the tholium ion, TM3+, is less than that of cerium ion, CE3+. When I look at the periodic table, this one here will have more protons than that. And so I say TM3+, has more protons than that. And since for both their outer electrons are in the same subshell, they will experience the same inner shell shielding or inner shell electron shielding. However, due to the high nuclear charge in TM3+, Remember, this has more protons than that, so because it has more protons, the nuclear charge is going to be greater, so its outer shell will experience greater attraction from the nucleus, leading to a smaller ionic radius. Moving on. Here they say, suggest a reason why the complex ions of the lanthanides can contain more ligands than those of the transition metals. This is quite easy. They are larger. You saw they contain more than six ligands, so I said, Ions of lanthanides are larger than ions of transition metals, so there is more space or orbitals to accept electrons from ligands. Part D, they say, explain why solutions containing that are colorless. The reason as to why these are going to be colorless is there is no F to F transitions, and therefore there is going to be no color. Part E says, hydrated cerium 4 ammonium nitrate contains Ce4+, NH4+, NO3- ions, and some water crystallization. Hydrated cerium-4 ammonium nitrate contains 23.97% cerium, 19.18% nitrogen, 2.05% hydrogen, and 54.80% oxygen by mass. They say calculate the empirical formula of this compound and hence write the overall formula showing the cerium, ammonium, nitrate ions, and water crystallization. I began by writing the CE, the N, the H, and the O, each of the percentages by mass are shown here, and we will divide through by the atomic mass to find the number of moles. The atomic mass of this is 140. That divided by 140 gives us this. That divided by 14 gives us that. That divided by 1 gives us that. And that divided by 16 gives us that. We go through to find the mole ratio. Because these were the smallest number of moles, we divide through by that to give us a 1. That divided by that to give us 8. That divided by that to give us 12. And that divided by that to give us 20. So this is going to be the empirical formula from the information given. So here they say an organic compound X with a molecular formula that did not react with acidified potassium dichromate 6 solution, but gave a red color with cerium-4 ammonium nitrate solution. X exists as a pair of optical isomers. They want you to deduce a possible structure of X and justify your answer. I want to take you back previously to the information we read. There was a statement down here that said cerium-4 ammonium nitrate is yellow in aqueous solution and gives a red color with all alcohols. So this is going to be telling when I take you back here. If it gives a red color with all alcohols, so it means this should be an alcohol. That is an alcohol. And we know if this alcohol does not react with acidified potassium dichromate, therefore it should be a tertiary alcohol. Since we have seven carbons, this was the only possible structure that could be obtained. So down here I said... X is an alcohol because it reacts with cerium-4 nitrate to produce a red color. 
And because X was not oxidized by addition of acidified potassium dichromate, it is neither a primary alcohol nor a secondary alcohol, and this confirms that it is a tertiary alcohol. I can confirm this is a tertiary alcohol because statement 1 said this is going to be an alcohol. So if this is an alcohol that is not primary or secondary, then it should be a tertiary alcohol. And also, because it has a chiral center, it means this is the only possible structure that would have given us a chiral center, and therefore, they should be the structure. Moving on, here they say, the amount of paracetamol in a tablet can be determined using a titration with cerium for ions. The tablets are crushed and then hydrolyzed in acid to form for aminophenol. So this is paracetamol and that is for aminophenol. For aminophenol is oxidized by cerium for ions. We can see this is the reaction. So the outline procedure is as below. The two tablets containing paracetamol were crushed and 0.8 grams of the powder was added to dilute sulfuric acid. The mixture was heated under reflux until the hydrolysis was complete. The solution was made up to 100 cm3 in a volumetric flask and 25 cm3 portions of the solution were titrated against acidified 0.100 mol per decimeter cube of cerium 4 plus using ferro in the indicator. The results are here. We have the mean titer was 21.70 cm3. They say calculate the percentage by mass of paracetamol in the tablet and give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. Here I began by calculating the number of moles of CE4 plus used. Number of moles should be concentration times volume, which is the concentration given 0 0.1 times the mean titer, which is 21.7 divided by 1000, and that gave me the number of moles. When we go back to the equation, we can see the mole ratio is going to be 2 to 1, and therefore the number of moles of 4 aminophenol are going to be 1 over 2 times 2.17 times 10 power negative 3. However, these are moles in 25 centimeters cubed of the 4 aminophenol, so I got 1.085 times 10 power negative 3 moles. Now I need to calculate the number of moles in 100 centimeters cubed. So moles of 4 aminophenol in 100 centimeters cubed should be 4 times this number of moles. Remember, if these are in 25, 100 is 25 times 4. So to find the number of moles in 100, they should be 4 times the moles in 25, which gave me 4.34 times 10 power negative 3 moles. The mole ratio of 4 aminophenol to paracetamol is 1 to 1. This is seen from the first reaction. This is 4 aminophenol and paracetamol. If the mole ratio is 1 to 1, it means the moles of 4 aminophenol are equal to the number of moles of paracetamol. I say so the moles of paracetamol are also equal to the moles of 4 aminophenol. And therefore, the mass of paracetamol should be the number of moles of paracetamol times the molar mass, which is that times 151, and that gave me that. So the percentage by mass should be the mass of paracetamol divided by the mass of the powder times 100, and that gave me 81.9%, and this was to three significant figures. So this brings us to the end of this video. This was the last part of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.